I have lots of questions for you. Um, our last speaker is Nigel McBride. Nigel is the Chief Executive of Business SA, which is the state's peak business and employer group. Nigel's past and present board memberships and chairmanships include Advantage, S uh, sorry, Advantage Ad Adelaide, Return to Work SA, and he's a state councillor for the Committee for Economic Development, CEDA. An immediate past Chief Executive and Managing Partner of Minta Ellison for 12 years, Nigel has operated at top levels of business and government and often provides input to other CEOs on key strategic issues. He's a sought after speaker on business strategy, leadership and risk management. Over to you, Nigel. Are you going, are you going to come Thanks down? very much, yeah. I'm sought after mainly because I'm free. I just want to point that out. Um, well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, can I just thank you for giving a damn, um, for taking the time to be here today because there's so many armchair commentators, so many sideline referees and, and uh, lounge chair critics. You've taken the time to come out, get involved in what is a really quite a complex argument, series of arguments, and frankly it's refreshing for me as somebody who does with, deals with policy all the time and, you know, how difficult are 30 minute time changes, for example, to actually have a subtle, nuanced, informed discussion and debate, and I underline informed. The problem with this debate isn't going to be uh, various views, it's going to be how informed those views are. Uh, and it's really, really important that we understand that. So I've got a few words of warning. First of all, there are going to be some people in this debate who are so ideologically and emotive and implacably opposed, if you gave them something that was white, they'd call it black. They just can't do anything else. They should be heard, but they're not going to really be informed in their approach. Um, there are other people who are at the other end going, yippee, rock and roll, let's go and make some money. This is really simple. Let's just dig a hole in the ground. When can we start? And of course, that's completely uninformed as well. It's pointless. And both of those uh, sets of arguments are really, really pointless and shallow and you know, they want to be heard, but they have no right to be heard because those aren't informed arguments. Then there's the people who run agendas, and I just want to put this to you because I even, I've even seen it here this morning, where it's, it's a bit more subtle than that. They'll scour the world for an example or an issue or something in history, and then they'll link it to another thing in your mind. Let me give you an example. Somebody might say to me, look, Nigel, in the 19, late 1920s, we had a deep recession, deep economic recession in Australia. What happened? And I could say, well, you know what? One thing we do know is we gave women the vote about that time. <laughs> it's outrageous, isn't it? Absolutely outrageous, completely dishonest, but I've just connected the women, women's right to vote in Australia with the recession that occurred immediately afterwards. They're both facts, but I've just linked them in your mind. And if you don't get an informed response to the rest of that, you're going to go, wow, women voting in recession, they go hand in hand. What we've heard today in a debate and a discussion about taking used nuclear waste into our state, probably into a remote thing, possibly through Darwin, who knows? We don't, we've heard about ports. I haven't heard that they've been cited anywhere. Um, we've heard about Maralinga atomic experiments. And we've linked that to this discussion. British atomic tests are not linked to this discussion. They've got nothing to do with it except I understand the tragedy of how people felt. I feel that tragedy. My father stood as a serviceman, as a guinea pig, in the Christmas Island British atomic tests. I believe he died early of cancer because he stood in front of that atomic test. We're not talking about atomic tests, ladies and gentlemen, and what we've done is cleverly linked that to this thing. We're not talking about Fukushima, a dodgy uh, old generation nuclear power plant that was sat on in a tsunami-ridden zone on a fault line. That's got nothing to do with our discussion. And yet it becomes, again and again, a very subtle way of linking two completely unrelated issues to bring fear and emotion. So the first two are easy to spot. They're extreme. The, second, the third one is very, very difficult because the nuances of ships, and I'm not sure whether that's a ship that's actually licensed to take materials. Craig, I'm not sure where you got the shot from. And... Well, actually, it's not... It's not Okay. No, I'll come back to you. We'll, okay. we'll have a panel session. Sure, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. So at the end of the day, I just wanted to talk about some, some misconceptions that I've heard because we've been on this. First of all, we're rushing it. We're rushing this whole debate. 
Um, this weekend is the beginning of probably what will be 20 years worth of consultation. If you go to what we learned in, in Northern Europe and Western Europe is that um, consultation never ends. This is the very beginning of a process that if, it, if the European model is right, it'll go on for 30 years, if we proceed. If we get to a point in the first five years, and this is the first weekend of the first five years and the first 10 years, why is it never going to end? Because you're, you're here today, as I understand it, over this weekend, to give that first sense of whether we should proceed to the next step. We'll then talk about regulatory models. We'll then talk about site selection opportunities. We'll then talk about community vetoes. And the one thing we learned in Europe was you don't proceed unless the community can veto. And one of our guests has brought that up today. One of the problems with the Indigenous people, they felt that they had no control. Well, that's not an acceptable model going forward. So there's all kinds of things we're going to consult on. The Finns have been doing this for 40 years. They're still consulting right up to the point of the final uh, building of this deep repository. So we're not rushing it, we can't rush it, this is the very beginning and congratulations on being here. Uh, why isn't any other country doing it? If it's so good, what are we putting up a hand for? Well, that's another misinformation, Russia's doing it every day. Russia will take uh, nuclear waste from all over the world, they are, they're making money out of it and sadly for the rest of the world they're weaponising the plutonium they get out of it. One of the reasons we'd like it here Ultimately, as we take that stockpile of potential weaponry away from the world that might use it, but Namibia are setting up to do this. Two European consortia are setting up to do it. It's a massive future market. It's a 100-year market. Right now, Japan, right now today, has $35 billion, Australian dollars equivalent, ready to help get somebody to help them deal with their waste. Japan, Taiwan, Korea, the Netherlands don't have an issue. Uh, they don't have an opportunity to, to get rid of the waste. Um, just to grab for money, we've got no moral obligation. I'd love you to ask me that on the panel. I think we've got a huge moral obligation. I'd like to talk about that given time. We're citizens of this planet. We're facing huge climate change issues. We know that nuclear, along with the renewables, is the only answer in the next 50 years for us to avoid the carbon-driven climate change that we're all fearing. Uh, you know, we can't sit here and say, not in my backyard, not when we mine it, not when we know it's going to go to support nuclear power to stop us having a climate change meltdown. We have a responsibility. Happy to talk about that. The economics don't stack up. We heard that today. The problem with the economics, and, you know, is what economics? Um, we don't, we haven't got a market, tradable market. You know, we're, I've heard it today. We don't. Uh, what we do know is that there are countries sitting there with 50 years worth of fuel, and they can't deal with it themselves. The price is going to be what they need it to be for it to happen. And there are all kinds of reasons why international treaties won't let them send it to Namibia, thank heavens, or Russia, thank heavens, or any other dodgy country who might do something silly with it. The reason why it would come here is simply that we have the international respect to deal with it properly and to do it in a way that's responsible. Um, finally, as we go, uh, the other few things that I've uh, heard around the traps, and I thought I'd raise them, it's too risky. And that's the first thing. When I went up there, I thought, well, no check is big enough. If my kids, if my grandkids are going to be at risk, you can't write a check that's big enough for me to take this on. And of course, we have to take risk in context. So risk in context is the following. So 58 people died falling out of bed in 2013 in Australia. I'm glad you made it today, but... You know, what I'm saying is you don't live a risk-free life. Uh, none of us do. Um, let me talk about what's really going on. 60,000 people work directly in the UK nuclear industry, and in 60 years there has not been one f a fatality. Neither has there been a fatality in Canada, France, Germany, India, and even the US, where, the, where it's probably got the worst track record. The US is shocking. I'm not surprised Craig's put up the US. It's a, it's a <laughs> we'd never go with the US model. They have stuffed it up regularly. Even when Japan has had eight deaths, six of those were industrial deaths with steam, two nuclear. I'm not happy about nuclear deaths of any kind or industrial deaths, but in an industry that's been going for 60 years, we've had a handful of deaths. But let's talk about the Australian workplace. We kill about 200 people a year in our workplace that's got nothing to do with nuclear. Over 1,000 people die on our roads. Uh, 5,500 people, we understand, die from so some level of obesity, yet we don't banned sugar and sugary drinks. Thousands or more are left 
injured with industrial disease. When you say, is this risky? Well, compared to everything we do in everyday life and the, ex uh, the risks that we apparently accept, we're not happy about them, it's incredibly low risk. And so the concept of this ghoul of the kind of the Simpsons leaky drums and the three-eyed fish cartoon approach, uh, if you, <laughs> I'm really hoping we can elevate this into actual facts, actual information, and actually have an informed debate. Ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with this thought. Facts over fear, truth over hyperbole, education over hysteria, transparency over entrenched agendas, and some intellectual honesty, please, over calculated misinformation. Thank you.